Good morning, Southside. Special welcome to any first-time guests. We're always glad to have anyone come and be a part of our family and worship our God together. Uh, Sunday, we, or Saturday, yesterday we had the memorial service for Sherry Schultz, and it, it was a powerful time where the gospel was just being preached from every angle and everyone who got up. And when it ended, there was just the sweet aroma of Jesus Christ. And so to God be the glory for the life, the faithful life of Sherry Schultz. Um, we have a special visitor I wanted to welcome as well. Uh, it's kind of like this uh, matriarch of our church, and she's, she's back in town today. Ann White, where did she go? Ann, stand up and just wave real quick. Come on. Yeah. Woo. She loved this body so well and beautifully, and it's just so good to have her back with us this morning. I wanted to take some time to kind of give you a lay of the land for the next couple months. My vacation is going to come up and begin in October. So I've just got one simple goal. I want to finish Romans before I go away. Um, (laughs) Doesn't that feel like sin to leave for a month when Romans is undone? So just pray for me. I need a lot of help in this. October 1st then is going to be a very special service for us. We're going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary as a church. That's beautiful. God's love and mercy has been abundant to us. And I just want to pause and give him thanks on that day. He has done more than I could have ever hoped or asked. His his faithfulness to my own heart, I just couldn't be overstated. And so I, I just want to share with you that Sunday, what the Lord's taught me about the church, how to shepherd it, how to be faithful, a practical plan for the next 25 years. And uh, just as we move into this kind of harvesting season. Uh, and then we're going to have a barbe- barbecue together after the service. What's the name of the place? Hickory House. So if you've ever eaten there, you're going to get some more Hickory House at the end of that service. Uh, so let's go to our God in prayer. Um, and, and as we go, as I go away, I'm taking like three books. I got another one this morning just on prayer uh, on my vacation. And so I'll, I'll, we, we're going to share kind of the trellis of the foundation biblically that we are trying to lay at the church. And the need of the moment is more prayer. Um, we, we need God, not more plans. And so I, I want us to, as a church, how are we going to grow in our praying together? Because the, the only way anything will ever happen is through God's power and that we would intercede as a, as a body at all times at his throne. Um, so that we'll be looking at that. So before we pray, I want to introduce you to our sermon this morning. If you'll open to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15, I just want to read verse 13 as we begin this morning. Paul says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is where we're going to go this morning. That is where this plane is going to land on that verse Uh, Some of you have walked in this morning and you don't feel much hope. You know, you've been battling depression. You've been battling stress, relational issues. There's some deep health issues going on, economical fears, political fears. Uh, Abounding in hope is just not where you're at this morning. And I just want you to see that Paul's prayer, his benediction for you this morning is for you to have it for it to be overflowing. And the joy of what I want you to hear this morning is by His Spirit. So if it was up to you to muster it up, you got no hope. But what we're going to see this morning is the Holy Spirit can cause it to abound and overflow. It's possible for every believer this morning, no matter what your circumstances, I want you to hear this, to abound in hope. And so I want to pray for that now and then pronounce this benediction upon you at the close of the sermon and ask God with all that comes in between, I'm going to call it logic on fire, to just fill you with hope. I don't ever want to play church. I want to look at his word this morning and for all of us to find this blessed hope. So let's pray to that end and join our hearts and all pray together now to our God and Father. Father, we come before you and we're in need of this abounding hope. Lord, we get drawn into so many things here. We start trying to put our tent stakes down. We try to find our hope in things lesser than God. So, Father, I pray that you would do more than we could ask or hope this morning. 
I pray that no believer would walk out of here without hope overflowing the depression, the discouragement, the sorrow, the things that are filling their heart. I pray, God, do a work this morning and let it overflow with hope. So meet us. Meet us, Lord, I pray. I pray for any unbelievers who are sitting in here this morning. God, let, let them walk out with hope for the first time. For no one can live without hope. God, hear the giver of hope. Please grant that to needy souls this morning, if that be the case. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me just read Romans 15, 1 through 6. When the last time we were in Romans, we looked at this. <clears throat> now we who are strong in, in the faith ought to bear with the weaknesses of those without strength and not just try to please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. Let that unite you so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Our unity is so big, it's the high note of our worship. It's to be in tune with God, to walk in a manner that's pleasing, to give Him an offering that is sweet. We don't just live for ourselves, but for others. Our hearts are united. The highest note is a united people of God putting on display the glory of God. And now in verses 7 through 13, we come to the second movement of this song. The second stanza of this glorious closing hymn that Paul's kind of wrapping up Romans with. I don't want you to miss where Paul is going with this. He wants more than, hey, let's all get along. Don't have divisions and factions. But it's this cry for deep, true unity is what he's going after. Truly one, growing together in the grace of God. It's more than just don't do these schisms. Be so filled in unity with what we have in Christ. Paul's going to tie the closing stanza this morning into the redemptive history of God. We're going we're to look at the whole flow of what God is doing in creation to bring us back to what is God about? What is his goal? What is his mission? What, why did he create? What's his purpose? And it's that through my son, says God, I want to bring Jew and Gentile together in fervent worship of their one God and one faith. That is what God is doing in the world. And I just want you to hear this morning, Gentiles, you've been brought into the gospel. You've been brought into God's program. This is big. It's the root of joy and hope. And so I want you to come and journey with me and ask God to let these things overtake your heart once again. So we're going to have a simple outline as we look at big truths. And the first one is our plea in verse 7, therefore accept one another just as Christ also has accepted us to the glory of God. And then Paul gives the plan of, of God's redemptive history. And then he closes with this beautiful prayer, a doxology that we've already read. So come with me to the plea. Therefore, in light of this one voice and mind and heart giving glory to God, accept one another, just as Jesus Christ has accepted us to the glory of God. Here is the main practical behavior change that God wants at Southside Bible Church. In case you missed it, back in Romans 14.1 is how he began the whole argument. Accept one another, the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. And now he closes out his argument in verse uh, 7 to accept one another, receive one another, to, to bring each other into your space, to bring each other into your heart, and to bring each other into your home. Uh, he said, practice hospitality, greet one another with a holy kiss. Be an accepting, welcoming people, so that with one voice we might glorify the Lord. So whether weak in faith or strong, whether 
uh, you got hangovers from growing up under a whole lot of law, or just someone who's really free. Whether you're a new believer, an old believer, whether you're cool or uncool, I hate that distinction probably more than, nothing gets my blood boiling more than when I hear that. So just, can you just mortify it? <laughs> Put it to death. We're all, no one's cool, please. As the body of Christ, you come in here and all that junk is over from the world. And we walk in and we're believers and brothers and sisters in Christ. And those distinctions just fall and die. And now this morning, Paul's going to go bigger and say, whether you're Jew or Gentile, this, this is just gone. Different races, different colors, different ethnicities. I want you to hear that the gospel breaks that down. And it goes both ways. It goes both ways. You come in here, I, I, I've seen pride and prejudice and it dies at the cross. And I've seen people who have been mistreated in this world because of the color of their skin. And you come in and you can't receive your brothers and sisters because of the chip. And so I'm asking both the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's saying there aren't those distinctions in the body of Christ. It dies at the cross. This stuff stops in the church. As we close this argument up this morning, I just want to ask you, what has Romans 12 through 15 done in your heart? Just pause. Has it awakened you to the law of Christ, to love? God doesn't want your perfect doctrine, your church attendance, your conservative politics. He wants you to enter into the body of Christ and love it with the gifts and the graces that he has given to you. If you have any excuse for why you can't do that, you're holding to a lie. It's a lie. Whatever your reason, and some of them I know they hurt, but I just want you to hear their lies. God's saying, I want you to be a welcoming, receiving, entering in people. Christ died for these ones. And he's received them and he's drawn them near. And now he's saying, and you won't? If Christ, the holiest one ever, has drawn you near, I can't draw you near because I'm so holy? Christ died for these ones. On this holy ground this morning, I'm begging you, will you repent? Will you change your thinking and love like Jesus Christ, this body? Just repent. Die to it. Be done with it. Verse 7 Accept one another just as Christ also has accepted us to the glory of God. If I could summarize it, I'd say this. Mutual love should be the aroma of those who have been loved by Jesus Christ. It's the simplest summary. We've been loved by Jesus Christ. Mutual love should just flow through us supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we move forward... I want you to get this. We have stuff in our heart that makes me a non-welcoming person. I still got hangovers from sin that, that make me want me to be the center of the universe. And Paul's going to break it and drive it out by the following arguments that we're going to look at. And I think they're profound. And I want you to come with me and I want you to let the Word of God have its way in your heart this morning, especially those who still are not welcoming and receiving, but judging. I just want today to be your final death blow and you get the victory to become this kind of person. So that's Paul's plea. It's my plea. It's God's plea. I pray. Let's look at the plan. Just as Christ has accepted us, to the glory of God. And now Paul is going to flush it out and he's going to go to the Old Testament and he's going to pull four passages and we could do a sermon on each one. And I just want to move, I, I think what's more important this morning is to understand what he's doing with these passages versus every detail of what the passages are about. So I want you to come with me to verse eight. <laughs> For I say, so now that is the explanation. I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. I, what a pregnant verse. I just, I'm going to lay out four points to this verse. 
Jesus became incarnate. God himself left glory, and he was born of a Jewish virgin. virgin. And in Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So he, he comes under the, the Mosaic law, and he's born into this world. And, the, and Paul says he became a Jew then to serve the Jewish people. He became a servant to the circumcised people. I, I did, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give himself a ransom for many. Isaiah said he came to be the suffering servant. He came on behalf of the Jews. They had a redemptive priority. In Romans 1, when we began this, the, the gospel, he said, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And so he came as a, as a Jew to serve the Jewish people. And the third one is it was on behalf of the truth of God. Jesus came to vindicate the truthfulness of God. God has been making these promises. He, and now he's going to come and show that God is truthful. God said it a thousands of years. Let every man, Paul said back in Romans 3, be found a liar. But God is true. And so he came into the world on behalf of the truth of God. And Paul says, so that he confirmed the promises given to the fathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Jesus was the fulfillment of all these promises. You trace your Bible of what he said he would do and all these covenants. And Jesus comes into the world to be what it's all been pointing to, the fulfillment. And he says, in your seed, Abraham, singular, all the nations are going to be blessed they're going to be blessed in this seed. And the seed is born under the law and he comes in and the promise, he fulfills the law and he dies and takes our curse from all of our law breaking. Second Corinthians, Paul said, all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. Every promise, everything that has been said finds its fulfillment in Christ now and to come. And so I want you to just take that in. Let it fill you with hope that God is truthful. He fulfills what he said. Like you can hope, as you look at your Bibles, I just marvel at all these promises and how they have been fulfilled in Christ. The more I study it, the more I'm taking up. And the reason this morning is so you really can hope. Like no one can come up with this. It is so divine and perfect and beautiful that I want your hearts to begin to just swell with hope because what God promised he has fulfilled in Christ, and he offers now to us. Look at verse 9. And for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. The Gentiles can give glory to God for mercy. And, and for us, we're familiar with that, but that was a big deal in redemptive history. And the way it can come is by the truthfulness of God. God is truthful. He keeps his promises. He took an oath. I swear by God, I will keep my promises. So Gentiles can hope. They can hope because they were in the heart and plan of God when he gave Abraham this blessing that in this seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. You were in that. In, in that seed now, we can all have blessing and salvation. So because Jesus was faithful to the Jews and fulfills all these covenants and promises and the law, the Mosaic law, the Gentiles now get promises. We, we get gospel, we get salvation, we get the forgiveness of our sins. So you sit here this morning, Gentile, you once were not a people, but now you're the people of God. You once were without hope. And now this morning, you're going to see we have the most abundant, beautiful, eternal, abounding hope. We were strangers to the covenants and promise. And now through the seed, we're brought in by the work of Jesus. You've been brought near to God. You no longer eat the breadcrumbs off the table. You're not second-class citizens. You get all of God. God has withheld nothing from you. And as Gentiles, you get right into the presence of the fullness of God. You are fully adopted. You're not a partial child. You get every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let hope start bubbling. We've, we've been received. We should treasure it all the more. Wild branches were grafted into the tree by faith. We should never cease to marvel at the great salvation that God has given to us. So Jews and Gentiles, welcome one another 
the way Christ has welcomed us to the glory of God the Father. I can't get over that all I had in me was sin to turn God away from me. And he drew me near in his Son, and he saved me not on the basis of deeds which I have done, but by his mercy, his washing and renewing of regeneration. Does that do anything to your judgmental, looking down heart, making divisions in your spirit? This just can't be. Welcome one another. One preacher said, the whole universe and history has been constructed by God for the glory of God so that in 2023, Christians would, be, would welcome one another. <laughs> this isn't small. This is gospel. So I want you to see what Paul's going to do now in this passage. Go back to Romans 15.4. For whatever was written in earlier times, the Old Testament, it was written for our instruction so that for the purpose, through perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So that these Scriptures would lead us to hope in all the trials and all the things that we're going to face. For the Jews, Scriptures were made up of three parts, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And now Paul grabs from each one of them. And he's doing it. He's going to take this redemptive history, and he's going to come, and he wants it to build hope in you this morning, he doesn't want you to fall asleep and just say, I don't really care about Jews and Gentiles and all that stuff. It doesn't mean much to me. It does to Paul. And it does to God. And he's saying this should build hope in you this morning. So if you just care about yourself, hope, you, don't you want to hope? And so this morning, he's just building it. So let's look at the, this beautiful bridge that he makes for us. For I say that Christ, um, verse 9, and for the Gentiles... Um, to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. This is a quote from 2 Samuel 15, 10. And in this text, David is delivered from his enemies. The king is exalted now, and he's the head, head over the nations. He's in an exalted position. And he just says, the, the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and may the God of my salvation be exalted. And because of this king now, it's therefore I will give you praise. I'll give you praise. And, and now I want the nations to hear of a God who set a king over the nations and he, he gives salvation and he's going to be praised. So the gospel is that this king has been enthroned and now he's giving salvation to all who will call upon the name of Jesus. And, and the Gentiles can now hope because we can receive this salvation. Then he goes to Deuteronomy 32 and verse 10. Again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, with the, with the Jewish race. So this is the song of Moses, and it's the anticipation then that the Gentiles are going to enter in to these mercies that God has promised, that they're going to come join in the praise of God for his great salvation over the earth. And so rejoice, Gentiles, you've been brought in to the promises of God. And then he moves into Psalm 117. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Let the nations praise God. This is the shortest psalm in the psalm book. It's just two verses. And he's just saying, sing. Sing for the great mercy of God. The great mercy and loving kindness of our Lord now is extended to the Gentiles. His faithfulness, his mercy, his truth, everything in Romans Go rejoice, give praise, O Gentiles, to your God. And then this beautiful passage that Nate read this morning uh, in verse 12 is Isaiah 11.10. <clears throat> and again, Isaiah says, There shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, and in him shall the Gentiles hope. And so the root of Jesse, who's, who's Jesse? So Jesse is David's father. And he's saying from this root of Jesse will come the Messiah. And branch is going to come, he says, for the healing of the nations. And so what is this saying is that we can hope in him. I just want to read you a passage in Matthew 22. It says the Pharisees come up and they're gathered together and they ask Jesus a question. 
I hate to do this. Can someone close the very back window so I'm not blind? All right. Whoever that is, thank you. So while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, what? Oh, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. They say, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? We're going to trap him. And they said to him, the son of David? And he said to them, well, then how does, the, how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put thy enemies beneath thy feet. And so Jesus says, if David calls this one Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare to ever ask a question again. They got shut up. He's, how, how does this son be called the Lord by his dad? So this is what Paul is saying. This is amazing, Southside. You can hope this morning in the root of Jesse. When he comes into the world and he is seated on his throne, the resurrection, all the work of Jesus, he's now endowed with mercy to the nations for any who call upon his name. Anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ is now plunged in the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. So now the nations can hope in the son of Jesse, in him. I pray. Spent all week on this. Don't base your hope on future health. Don't, don't make that your hope. Don't make it a spouse. Don't make it money. Don't make your hope your job, your earning power, your investments, your kids, your grandkids. Why so downcast all of my soul? Because I've made hope in other things. Put your hope in God. My soul is downcast because I'm hoping in something other than God. Put your hope in Jesse's son, Jesus. Jesus, you alone are, are my hope. You're the only hope for my children. You're the only hope for ministry. You're the only hope for Southside. You're the only hope as Mateo takes the gospel and Ray and their wives and family. Jesus is the only hope. And Americans have been trained to hope in everything else. Wall Street, just hopers in anything but God. And so my question this morning is, what are we to hope in? Well, I'm going to stay in Romans. Go back to Romans 5. We were meeting outside during COVID, during... Romans 5, so if you don't remember it, you get grace this morning. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. We are plunged into the middle now of God's grace and favor and acceptance, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And so what are we hoping in? The glory of God. That's the believer's hope. Flip over to Romans 8.20. I'm going to start in verse 18, actually. One of the great verses of Romans. I consider, I reckon, that the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. Whatever I'm going through right now, it's not worthy of what's coming with the glory of God that's going to be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation that we live in right now, guys, was subjected to futility when Adam sinned. And it, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, so that in hope, this creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation's groaning and suffering the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Our hope is that God is going to set this world free from the corruption and the fall. And, and God and man are back together, and man and man and man in creation. 
we have a, an amazing thing. We're going to get a new heavens and a new earth with new bodies to enjoy it forever. That's our blessed hope. And Jesus is going to be put on display and worshiped forever. Now Paul's just going to break into prayer. He's going to give us our benediction. And I'm going to break the benediction down into six steps I read this week to awaken abounding hope in you. So will you come enter in with me, saints of God? I, I just beg in God to give you this this morning. We've spent four years of going verse by verse through Romans and Paul's wrapping it up in a song in a a benediction right now. And there's a reason that you turn diamonds over and you look at them from every angle. It's been beautiful, but they've been building something really sweet and beautiful. And, and here we go. Four years. And this verse has taken my heart away and I'm asking that God grants it to you. First, verse 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing. God himself, I want you to hear this, is the God of hope. What a great name. Now may the God of hope, I, I get to spend the rest of my life on that one phrase. Our God is the God of hope. This is the only place that hope will ever be found. It's the only true, abiding, everlasting hope. If, if you're looking for hope in all other places, here's the answer. The God of hope. The God of hope, hope that cannot be taken away. Like every hope outside of Christ can be taken away. We just celebrated a memorial service yesterday. Hope can be taken away. Your spouse can be taken away, your health, your homes, your country. First Peter, if you'll remember when we studied it, where you've been born again, Peter said, to what? A living hope. Every other hope is dead or dying. God has taken some of mine away. Your whole life, he's coming at you to grow you and steal hopes, not to make you miserable. If you're suffering this morning, it's not just to make you suffer. It's to get you into a better hope, a best hope. The hope in God kind of hope is what he's doing in each one of our lives. The hurts that we've wrestled him and we, we fought, let me get my hope back. I've lost every time when I've tried to wrestle God and get my hope that I want in this world. God gives us books like Romans and the whole Bible to lead us to hope because he's the God of hope. He wants you to hope. This whole book, all those promises, Jews, Gentiles, everything we just went over, God has done history so that this morning, Gentiles, you would hope. Hope in God. Let that bless you. Your God is the God of hope, not despair. Any despair is Him taking away a false hope. So this morning, I just want you to see that the God you serve is the God of hope. Secondly, the God of hope speaks words of promise. We just looked at four of them. All these Old Testament passages, He kept saying, so the Gentiles can hope. We've been brought into the Jewish Messiah to be the people of God. And so hear this. This is what the Scriptures are for. You need to read it this way and read it often. Paul quotes the Scriptures to lead you to hope. Here's the pathway to get to hope is through the Scriptures. It's why the church is moving away from laboring in the Scriptures to see its promises and its magnificence of all that we've seen in Romans. The, the scriptures are to lead you to hope. And so we need them. We need to understand them. We need to look at them from every angle. Um, when it gets boring, dry, wake up. Keep looking and say, God, lead me to hope. Show me the glory and the beauty of what you, you're the God of hope. And you've given me scriptures and truth and amazing promises to lead me to this place. The word of God is essential. And I pray that you treasure it and you live into it and you fight for hope daily. Hope gets produced through the Word of God. And everything else all day long says, hope in this, hope in this, hope in this. And if you don't fight it in the Scriptures, you'll hope in this. 
And so we've got to fight through the Scriptures the hope in our God. And thirdly, Paul says it's by the power of the Holy Spirit there at the end of verse 13. And so that's how you're going to abound in hope. Please hear this. This is to take away any hope of a system, a work, some strategy to get hope, six easy steps for hope. It's to bring us to the only place that this kind of hope can overflow in us is by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and is the only one who can produce this kind of a hope that we're looking at this morning, the kind that I want and the kind that I need. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can show you Jesus this way so that it fills you with hope. The kind that doesn't blow away with every wind of change in circumstance. I, I need a hope that's not bound and anchored to my circumstances. I, I need a hope that is steadfast and enters within the veil and it can't be blown away. So I want you to get this. Romans has made this clear. We come into the world hoping in one thing, what? Our, ourselves. We saw it in Romans 1 through 3. Our hope is self-exaltation, self-reliance, self-determination. That, that's our battle. And when we come in, we will not hope in God. We will only hope in ourselves. That's why every cult is hoping in yourself, your merit. And so what I want you to see is the Holy Spirit has to do it. You have to be born again into this living hope. The Spirit has to come and make you alive in Jesus Christ so that you can hope in Him. Now as we close out, this is all objective. Those three things are all outside of me. The, the God of hope, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the Scriptures. So how does the Holy Spirit make it subjective to me where, where I feel it and it, I have it. And so I, I, need, I need hope. So how, how does it go from on the outside to get to the inside? And if you'll look in verse 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in doing what? In, in believing. It's, it's going to be faith. And this is what the Holy Spirit does in us to, to get this. For me, I've told you this, but there was a, a night in June of 1987, I walked into Mile High Stadium, and I, I always went to watch football games there, and when I walked in, I, I'm like, what is this? I could feel something strange in this stadium. And I was walking into the Billy Graham crusade, and as I sat there, the word of promise began to go forth about how I could have peace with God through Jesus Christ and find forgiveness for my sins. And I'm just, it was just like me and nobody else in that stadium. And I'm sitting there listening, and as I was, faith began to fill my heart. And I believed in Christ right there, and joy and peace just started filling. Faith awakens in our hearts joy and peace. To have joy and peace in believing. And these are the two things that everybody in the world is seeking. Everybody, talk to them. They want joy and they want peace. And they were the two things that I wanted so bad, but they were elusive to me as an unbeliever. I, I, I thought I had it in my party life, and then that hope went away. I had a best friend whose sister was killed in a car accident driving home from college, and it's the first time someone my age died. And I was just thrown into a tailspin and all peace and joy was gone. And then I'm wrecked trying to find hope. But God, that night in June, as the Spirit blew through the message of Jesus Christ, I believed. And peace and joy began to fill this troubled heart. And I was shot out of a cannon. And I want you to hear then joy is active and expressive. It sparkles and flashes like a diamond. Peace, a, a heart is joyous and calm with a quiet manner. One writer said, peace is joy resting and joy is peace dancing. We work with joy, we rest with peace, and we die in peace. And so I just, all week, just kind of looking at joy and peace. Joy and peace. That's what the whole thing the world is looking for. Joy and peace. And peace. I love what Spurgeon says, oh, which do you choose, joy or peace? He says they're twin sisters. One who believes in the God of hope has joy 
and peace so that you might abound in hope. A hope sandwich from the root, from the beginning of hope to abounding in hope, the root of Jesse coming into the world, accomplishing salvation, fulfilling the promises made to the Jews, being raised up as head over all, so that now a Gentile like me can call upon the name of the Lord in hope in Jesus Christ. I have been included in this great salvation, joy and peace. Joy and peace. This amazing hope is the foundation and cause of our joy and our peace. Don't you love that none of those are circumstantial? They're all anchored in the root of Jesse. Joy and peace, so that you might abound in hope. It's not static. Hope, joy, and peace can all be growing. So Southside has the beautiful truths of Romans led you to hope with peace and joy. Is this what it's done for you over these four years? And just stop. Do you believe the Word of God? We have looked at it from every angle. And now there's this, do I believe? Will I entrust my soul to this gospel? To the sure promises of God? To the truthfulness of God? To the certainty of his salvation? Are you going to spend your whole life in unbelief and wavering? Or are you going to finally just say, I surrender all. I believe this gospel. And when I lean and trust and rest, joy and peace and believing and abounding in hope, it's just time to rest in it. Some of you are just back and forth. You just rest in it. It's certain. I, I can't get over reading how beautiful the work of history is so that everybody could hope in Jesus Christ. Marvel, believe, trust, and be filled with hope. This is my prayer and desire for you that you would abound in hope and believing his word and letting it dwell richly in you. This is so big because we get filled up and abounding in hate and jealousy and unforgiveness and bitterness and self-pity and cares of the world. How do we get rid of that stuff? That's what most people ask me for counsel. How do I get rid of it? The only way is to, from the inside to have an overflowing hope that fills us by believing the promises of God that are yea and amen in Christ. It brings healing. It drives out this other stuff because I am loved and accepted by God in the gospel. Abounding hope, peace, and joy. Our calling is to help each other believe the word of God so that we might abound in hope. I just want everybody to have that absolute certainty that whatever unbelief, whatever doubt you have, come see somebody. Seek us out to get rid of whatever it is that's keeping you from the fullness of joy and abounding hope. Let's, let's dig in on the gospel. What I've discovered in my own heart is when I have false hopes, you know, you know what false hopes are? Idols. When I, when I have false hopes, my joy and my peace are tied to them. And they rise and fall with, with my sense of my idol. Or is everything well with my idol? And if it is, oh, I, I can rest. And if it isn't, I, I got to go fix it. I want you to hear this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't change. Your acceptance can't change. Your salvation, your declared righteous can't change. So my hope is unchanging because it's in Christ. It's certain and it's based on God and his promises. Do you understand what's being offered to us, friends? Abounding hope in God. I shared this with a couple of you, but I, I heard this illustration a couple of weeks ago. Say that you got the privilege to go into Fort Knox. And they're like, go in. And take as much as you want. Just go in and grab, grab whatever you want. And you come out with 25 cents. Whose fault is that? The, the, the ninny who grabbed 25 cents with everything. And I just want you to hear this this morning. God is offering all of himself to you. American Christianity just takes such a small portion of God. And the gospel gives you all of God. He's for you. 
He loves you. You have a certain hope this morning. Take all of God. Quit stopping short. Jesus purchased you God. I love that the gospel's God. I'm going to close with one last thought. I've said that twice. I came across this on New Year's. I want to meet this guy in glory. His name was Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. Lived in 1700 to 1760. Probably a good Irish guy. Uh, <laughs> Zinzendorf. So Mr. Zinzendorf had eight life goals. He said, I want to preach the gospel. I haven't seen this one on many lists. I want to kill sin relentlessly. I want to be faithful to my wife. I want to love my children. I want to serve the church. And I want to die. And the seventh goal is I want to be forgotten. How many people do you hear say that anymore? It's like, I just want to be remembered. I want to be forgotten. Because all that matters is Jesus. And I, I want to be forgotten. And number eight, I want to reign with Christ forever. My hope. Like, I got it. I just want to live into my hope and die, be forgotten, and go get the hope that I've lived for all of my days. So just, let's go. Hope. Abounding hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray the Holy Spirit would fill us up this morning as we look at all the beauties and promises of Christ and what he's done for us so that our salvation is certain and our hope is certain. And I want to close out with just one last word. If you're here and you're an unbeliever, would you wake up? Someone nudge him. I just want one word. Is your, your hope is dying or it's dead. As, you, as you've walked in here this morning, whatever you've been hoping in, it's dying or it died and it, it brought you in maybe this morning to just say, what's, what's life? I don't have any hope anymore. All the things that I were hoping in have been taken away and I sit here with no hope. It's a sad thing to live this way. And it's a sad thing to die this way because when we die this way, we go to the place where one man said the sign over hell says abandon all hope because there's no more hope. You'll never get out. It'll never get better. There is no hope at the end of this. So what's being offered to you by God? By God this morning? He wants you to have a true and a real and a living hope. He sent His Son into the world to come and fix this problem of sin and our separation and our enmity to God. And His Son went up on a cross and He bore the wrath for our sins. And as He bore it, our sins can now be forgiven. And as we look at Jesus dying in our place on a cross for what we deserved, it takes the enmity out of your heart and it makes you love God. And now you believe in Him and now your hope is God. Everything is Him now and you look for the day when you die and you go be with Him. So your death day will now be your best day instead of your worst day. And that's what God offers to, to all. He holds it out. Anyone who will come, come to me and He'll give you life. So I pray that you would not leave this place without a living hope in Jesus Christ who has been raised from the dead and has accomplished a certain and sure salvation. And the way you get it is not by works, but by holding out an empty hand. I have nothing. I look only to Jesus Christ for my salvation. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I thank you for hope. Please let it abound and overflow in every heart this morning. Let joy and peace just flow in believing the glorious gospel of what you have done and what you've accomplished in Jesus. God, don't let us walk away with 25 cents. Let us walk away with all of you, trusting you, loving you, delighting in you, following you, 
Lord, we don't have to be our own gods. We don't have to take care of ourselves. We have a Father in heaven, and so I pray let every heart this morning be taken up with their God and hope fully in him with a certain salvation. God, let us now with one accord and one voice stand and sing your praises together as Jews and Gentiles from all over the world. God, let there be a unity and a harmony in this gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen.